All right, so up next, and as I walk back over to where I'm sitting, I'll start playing her walk-up music to Who Runs the World. We have Dr. Devin Inez, who's going to be telling us about her organoid work coming from the University of Washington. She has a number of uh, T awards, or T90 and a T32, that's been funding her work. And she also let me know that she just got a provisional patent in, which is why she is running the world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do I need to do so? There we go. All right. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So, yes, I, because of this patent, have the opportunity to tell you a little more about some of the things I've done. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, the uh, salivary gland organoid I've been working on and how we're developing that into a uh, model for diabetic salivary gland dysfunction. So I'll start a little bit about me. So when I started my undergraduate career at UC Riverside, I knew I liked science, but I didn't really know um, what a scientist really looked like or what it looked like to become a scientist. And so, but I did know what it looked like to become a doctor, so I said, good, I'm going to be a doctor. Um, and that all kind of changed uh, toward my, the end of my junior year when one of my professors was like, hey, by the way, I'm looking for undergrads for my lab. And I was like, OK. Um, so I said, hey, you know, I, why not? I don't know what that looks like. Let's join. And I was introduced into this world where rather than using the knowledge that already existed, I had the opportunity to create new knowledge. And that was wild to me. And so that summer, I left to study abroad in France already planned, like a year before. Um, but I thought, man, I think this is what I want to do. And it was going to be the beginning of my senior year. And I said, well, I guess I'm applying to grad school from France. Took the GRE in Paris, took the subject GRE in Toulouse twice, and uh, submitted my applications. And by some miracle, I was accepted. And so I also did my PhD work at UC Riverside in the laboratory of Dr. Nicole Zoneden, who was interested in cellular mechanisms controlling bone development. And that's where my love affair with cellular regulation, um, or well, molecular regulation of cell fate kind of was born. So for my PhD work, I looked at the control of these two microRNAs on the phasic expression of beta-catenin during bone development, and how that phasic expression gave us first mesenchyme and then um, bone. And in my postdoctoral work, I've had the opportunity to really elevate that, going from a more um, mechanistic question to one that I can use this regulation of cell fate to have an actual application in regenerative medicine. And so I've been working on organoids um, to model disease, and I'm going to tell you about the work I've done with salivary gland organoids. So to preface this, uh, I think saliva has a lot more function than we give it credit for. So we con commonly associate this with digestive function, but in actuality, it does a lot more things. It has a lot of antimicrobial properties. Um, it's incredibly important for tooth mineralization. It has buffering capacity. It does wound healing for us. So consequently, when our salivary glands don't work, we have problems. And so people who have dysfunctional salivary glands have a lot more oral infections. There's a lot of uh, dry mouth and inflammation in the mouth. There's a lot of gum disease and tooth decay and loss. And depending on how severe the dysfunction is, you can have difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, and this chronic feeling of burning in your mouth. And so while we know that this is not something fatal, um, sometimes people fail to understand how important this is because of the lack of fatality. But it's important to note that um, ongoing studies are showing that salivary gland dysfunction or oral health problems in general have r far greater implications than just discomfort and low quality of life. We're actually finding that people with poor oral health have increased uh, incidence of neurodegenerative disease, including Alzheimer's disease, increased heart disease, altered gut microbiomes, and uh, increased inflammation in patients that have asthma and COPD. Additionally, we're finding that salivary glands turn out to be excellent reservoirs for viral infections, including noroviruses that give us our stomach flus and COVID-19. And people who have dysfunctional salivary glands have worse infections. So understanding salivary gland development and salivary gland disease and dysfunction is becoming incredibly important. So we have three major salivary glands. They produce about 90% of our saliva. And we have hundreds of little minor glands that are located throughout our oral mucosa that keep everything kind of wet and lubricated. And these glands all have this really uh, uh, complex ductal structure. 
that are terminated in these um, uh, secretory acinar cells, and they're surrounded by these little myoepithelial cells that contract and help move the saliva through the ductal system. Um, studies we've had so far have been primarily done in mouse, mostly because people tend not to like it if you want to take their salivary glands away, what with them not being regenerative and all. And so our ability to study human salivary gland development and function and disease has really been stymied. However, mice and humans have distinct differences in the function and, and composition of their saliva. If we think what mice are using their saliva for, it's not quite the same as what people are using their saliva for. I mean, we don't tend to lick each other to kind of know that we, that, we are, that we are family and things like that. So, so humans have different needs for their saliva. So we really need a human-specific model to study these things. And we didn't have one, so I decided to make one. And to do that, I needed to better study uh, the development of human salivary glands. And so um, we conducted uh, single cell sequencing on human fetal salivary glands um, and generated the first human fetal salivary gland atlas. Thank you for talking about that, because now my talk makes more sense. Um, and I won't talk about a lot of the really, really cool things we found here in interest of time, but here is a link in case anyone is interested in looking at that. That is the published work for this. But what I will tell you is that we were able to identify various signaling pathways that drove different cell populations, and we were able to then use that information to develop um, a rapid protocol for uh, a human salivary gland organoid. So we start with induced pluripotent stem cells that we grow in 3D, and similar to salivary glands, we see that they begin to bud and then they begin to branch. And by day 50, what we see is this really beautiful organization of keratin-19 positive ductal cells that have um, duct-like organization and, and, and polarization, separate from the uh, salivary amylase expressing acinar cells. And we even see um, um, ACTA2 positive myoepithelial cells localized around the acinar cells reminiscent of what we see in human salivary gland tissue. Additionally, we observe that uh, starting in the 20s or so of development uh, of this organoid, we see these little acellular vesicles begin to bud off of the side of the organoid, um, and then they eventually blow off completely and settle in the bottom. And these can actually be collected, and by day 50, they are numerous. And um, we can actually see, if we move the tray, how fluid they are. So there's one right here, and there's another one here. And we think that these are going to be vesicles that are they're secreting this kind of saliva-like fluid that we don't expect to be saliva, which is incredibly complex, but we expect it to be saliva-like, having amylase expression and some other factors. Um, additionally, we observe that some of the cells express beta-3 tubulin, a neuroepithelial marker. And this is of particular interest because one of the big drivers of salivary gland dysfunction is uh, facial nerve damage. And like salivary glands, these nerves do not regenerate, suggesting that then we may be able to manipulate this organoid further to generate their own nervous tissue to have regenerative capacities in the, in the future. So now we have an organoid. What do we do with it? Well, um, one of the big drivers of salivary gland dysfunction is going to be diabetes, namely because of the prevalence of diabetes itself. So people with diabetes experience more oral health problems. And studies uh, looking at uh, saliva in diabetic subjects compared to healthy individuals found that saliva itself um, has a lot higher concentration of glucose and a lot lower concentration of salivary amylase. Additionally, we see reduced salivary flow rate, reduced pH, and a lot of imbalance in terms of electrolytes. Um, so we know that the composition is, is, is altered but we don't really know why or by what mechanism this happens. And that is what I'm interested in using this organoid for. And so I, inter I was interested then in trying to turn this organoid model into a diabetic model. So other work that I'm doing in the lab focuses on using um, blood vessel organoids to investigate therapeutics for diabetic vasculopathy. And in those cases, um, we have the organoid and we culture them in what we're calling diabetic conditions. Um, which is a high glucose and concentrations of the more common inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha and IL-6. And what we see in that case is that we see a complete disruption of tight junctions and an increased deposition of collagen-4. And these characteristics are uh, the same characteristics that we observe in human blood vessels, indicating that this milieu kind of drives a, a diabetic response. Um, now, because saliva is basically an ultrafiltration of human blood plasma, it stands to reason that saliva um, 
would be in, in a similar kind of state as, as blood vessels. And so we hypothesized that we could use a similar environment as a proof of concept to see if we could make this uh, salivary gland organoid respond to a diabetic environment. So that's what we did. And what we observed was in our preliminary analysis, we find that um, compared to control where we do see distinct regions of salivary amylase and keratin-19 positive cells, we see a lot of disorganization and a severe reduction in salivary amylase indicating that these organoids can indeed be developed as a diabetic model. Now, of course, diabetic milieu is, is much more complex than some cherry-picked cytokines and some high glucose that we don't really, you know, we, we kind of have a, a guesstimate of how high it is. This level is basically as high as a human could experience without dying. Um, and there's arguments for and against that. But what we think is a better uh, thing to do is we've, we've decided to collaborate with the Diabetes Research Center at the University of Washington who can gain access to human um, plasma samples from diabetic and healthy individuals. And we think that will be a better, more clinically relevant representation of the diabetic milieu. And so we are collaborating with them to work on that now. Additionally, because uh, the characterization of diabetic saliva right now is so basic, we are working with the School of Dentistry to have a broader characterization of the saliva. And we're interested in taking into account um, comorbidities and other factors that tend to affect diabetic individuals, including sex, age, um, hormonal status of, of the patients, and uh, importantly, diabetic polypharmacy. So diabetics take a lot of different drugs that could also affect salivary gland function. And so in doing this, we want to really be able to isolate the effect of diabetes, the disease, on saliva as opposed to all of these other confounding factors. And so as we're developing this, we're interested in asking the question, what is the molecular cause of salivary gland dysfunction and diabetes? And this has been asked in a lot of organoids. And one of the kind of uh, overlapping things that we see is that inflammation um, leads to metabolic changes, leads to epigenetic changes, and we then hypothesize, or I guess we even less than hypothesize, we assume we will also see some of these changes in salivary gland. And because of the importance of mitochondria in salivary gland function, these are super necessary for the secretion from the ACE in our cells and for the secondary saliva uh, uh, um, generation in the striated duct, we hypothesize that our big driver of this is going to be disrupted mitophagy in both the ACE and our and the uh, salivary gland and epigenetic modification of genes that drive these things. And so we're very excited to be able to use the organoid to really for the first time ask these questions. So this, this work's gonna have a lot broader implications. So we're asking this question in terms of diabetes, and diabetes is a disease of metabolic dysfunction and a disease of inflammation. And a lot of diseases that affect salivary gland are actually in a similar vein in inflammation. So one of the bigger ones is Sjogren's syndrome, and this is an autoimmune disease that affects not only salivary gland, but also lacrimal glands that produce our tears. And um, patients also experience uh, uh, skin dryness and vaginal dryness. So all of these secretory epithelium are kind of damaged. And so we believe that our work can also shed some light on some of these other tissues, uh, given these, the similarities in structure and function of a lot of these exocrine tissues. We can ask questions, okay, well, if this is damaged in this gland in this way, can we ask these same questions in these other tissues? Um, we also are looking for viable pharmacological therapeutics for exocrine gland dysfunction, namely salivary gland, because in case people aren't aware, the current solution is um, uh, what is effectively fake saliva that patients have to spray into their mouth multiple times a day. And it's basically putting a Band-Aid on the problem and not actually solving the problem. And so we're seeking pharmacological therapeutics. But the ultimate pipe dream for this um, which would eliminate the need to use pharmacological solutions at all would be bench to bedside approaches where we can develop this in such a way that we can take patient cells, create them some salivary gland organoids, put them in their face, solve the problem. Um, so we see a, a lot of future potential for these uh, organoids. So I've spent all of this time telling you about one of my major passions, and I want to tell you now about one of my other major passions. Um, and Keelan's talk actually speaks a lot to what I'm getting at here. So um, in my journey, I have uh, hit a lot of roadblocks and a lot of setbacks, oftentimes due to what I feel was more than my fair share of challenges. And 
because of that, for much of my career, I've said, okay, well, my, my job and my goal is going to be to make sure that people coming up after me don't have to experience these setbacks or ask themselves whether they belong. And so I'm going to put this mentorship, you know, put these practices in my mentorship. And so as, as I'm standing here at the advent of a, what, what feels like the advent of a lot of these diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, I have a lot of hope that change is truly on the horizon. But as I'm really thinking about what is going to be my legacy as a researcher, I'm starting to understand more and more that this, this uh, idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion needs to go beyond mentorship and extend really into the way that I do my research and the motivation behind my research. So Keelan talked a lot about uh, health disparities. Diabetes is a health disparity. Diabetes predominantly affects individuals of color and individuals of lower socioeconomic status. So in the research I showed you today, all of these cells were derived from a 34-year-old Asian male. Not really our demographic for diabetic individuals. Great start, but as we're designing the research, we really need to say, okay, if we're addressing a disease that predominantly affects people of color, the cells need to be derived from people of color. So these are the kinds of things I'm looking to uh, look into. Additionally, in re with regard to health disparities, we all have this excellent goal of making therapeutics for people, but the pharmaceutical industry is a multi-billion dollar industry that often excludes people who need these things the most. So as I'm looking to develop these therapeutics, it's, for me, it's not going to be a question of I need to develop a therapeutic. It needs to be a question of how do I develop an affordable, accessible therapeutic that affects the people who need this the most or the people who are most afflicted by this thing. And so this passion of mine for diversity, equity, and inclusion spreads then to advocacy and to outreach to ensure that my training of my scientists and my own work includes all of these things. And so this is a very important passion of mine. So um, I want to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Hanna Rojola Baker, for taking this salivary gland uh, uh, trip with me because nobody works on salivary gland but me. That's my thing. Um, but I especially want to thank my, my very talented undergrad, Hee Young Jung, who is about to start his own um, grad school journey, and then all of my collaborators um, for their help, and of course the Birth Defects Research Lab, who uh, gave us the fetal samples that facilitated the research that kicked all of this off. And I would love to take all of your questions. Didn't I tell you Dr. Devin was going to rule the world? All right, so we already have a. Keelan just cheated. She sits next to me, so she got a box already. <laughs> <laughs> Starts. <laughs> Oh, okay, so uh, is there a difference between like the alterations that you see in salivary glands between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Or is it kind of all the same? So, so far what we know about that is that they both have reduced salivary amylase, but it's not super clear if there's other differences. Uh, the question I definitely have going forward, particularly given the nature of things like Sjogren's, which is also autoimmune, and a lot of these things occur secondary to other autoimmune diseases, and so... Um, as far as we know now, there's no difference between the, re the, there's a reduction in salivary flow rate, but the rate by which it's reduced, which is roughly like 30%, is about the same. So those questions have been asked, but again, the molecular changes that we see, um, the demographics that are affected, that's not, that's not super clear. Hi, over here. Um, great talk. Um, I was curious about those little neuron-like things you saw. Uh, <laughs> Me too. So, have you looked at other neuronal markers to see if it's some sort of a weird beta tubulin artifact or there are actually neurons? And then my second question is, have you considered maybe doing, I think they're called assembloids, like mixing a neuronal organoid with your uh, salivary gland organoid to see if it enhance growth or... I don't know. So um, I have not looked at other neuronal things. I got a little distracted, but I did use two different tubulin antibodies because at first I said this must be a mistake, <laughs> and I got a different antibody. Um, just used it with both antibodies, so that's cool. Um, beta tubulin does mark all of the progenitors, so it's, I think, very within the realm of possibility that these are like neuroepithelial progenitor type mm -hmm. cells, which is why I say I think we can manipulate it to make them. I certainly don't think they're full-on neurons or, you know, nerve tissue, but I think they have potential, which is pretty cool. 
Um, in terms of the, the assembloids, I have considered that. I'm considering that for both the neuronal aspect and the vascular aspect because I did stick them. In, I mean, I, and I waited until they were kind of like old. They were, they were fully, fully mature. But I did stick them in kidney capsule and they did not vascularize. So now the question becomes, do I need to vascularize them myself or do they just need to be like in a more growth state to do that? But um, we haven't had the chance to go back and revisit that. Uh, this is super cool stuff. I want to ask you sort of about the end of the talk and how that interacts with, uh, I mean, it, Jay mentioned before that you've got a patent for this stuff, right? And I guess uh, for me, I've always been sort of scared about like interacting with patents because I'm like, oh no, this is a way that people can make money and restrict these sort of ideas, right? I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that goal interacts and like I'm sure you've thought very, very carefully about that. So when I thought about whether or not I wanted to do the patent, the way that I kind of looked at it was how am I going to fund an ultimate clinic? Because my, my, my goal is bench to bedside, and clinical trials are super freaking expensive. And I thought, how am I going to pay for this? And I think the way to pay for this is going to be to license the technology. I have seen other – the blood vessel organoids that I make are from Josef Penninger's lab. I modified the protocol to match our purposes. But he licensed that recently, the stem cell technology, so you can just buy the kit and, you know, make it easy. Not that they're hard to make with the paper, but I suppose it streamlines it in some way. So I kind of envision something like that, such that it will make money that, you know, when I go, okay, well, like, I want to, um, you know, pay for clinical trials. Like, maybe an investor will be interested in putting money toward that because they see an interest, but I see uh, as somebody financing the outcome of what I want. The question of, of how we make it affordable to people is a question I, I have to work on because I do see that that can kind of create some problems. But we won't even get it to patients if it doesn't have the proper clinical trials in the first place. So I'm kind of thinking on that route first. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, beautiful talk. And back to the science, I have three questions at least, but I'll just <laughs> cover three. They're, they're easy though. The first is um, when you had the, the organoids in the diabetic um, uh, conditions, uh, did you need to have the high glucose or was just the inflammatory environment enough? So I haven't actually tested the um, inflammatory cytokines without the glucose, but in the organoids that I modeled them after, they actually tested in, uh, high glucose with and without cytokines and found that the high glucose by itself, because there aren't immune cells, the high glucose by itself was not sufficient to, to make them diabetic looking. Um, so it seems that those, you know, in the absence of an immune environment that leads to the inflammation, you actually do need to put in the cytokines. So I think the blood plasma will help with that. And um, were you able to take a, 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 an organoid under normal conditions and then change it with uh, this incubation so that you could model like the onset of uh, adult diabetes? Or did you have to have the conditions there from the very beginning? I uh, know we actually let them grow to maturity and then, and oh, then expose yeah. them to the, so yeah. yeah, it's the onset. So the, we're trying to model type two, so you know, they have to be healthy first. And then the mitophagy, I have to ask. Of course. <laughs> so what, what is making you think that mitophagy is specific here? And are you thinking, I thought HIF went by, so you're thinking it might be HIF-mediated mitophagy versus different so, pathways? Um, my, mitochondria are super necessary in certain cell populations for their function. So ACE and R cells require a lot of mitochondria to, to facilitate all the secretion. Uh, and secretion is impaired. And also striated duct, uh, uh, they're called striated because under electron microscopy, there's rows of mitochondria that they find. And what those are facilitating is the massive amount of ion exchange um, and, and secretion that they do because they modify the primary saliva to secondary saliva. And the milieu is damaged, including the electrolyte composition. So it's my hypothesis that the flow rate and the composition are damaged because the mitophagy in those two cells is impaired um, I, I have found in other tissues that it seems that my, um, mitobiogenesis is never impaired. It always seems to be the ability to deal with the damage that is caused by the oxidative stress. So because mitochondria are so important, I really suspect that the damage is going to be pretty well due to damaged uh, mitochondrial function and, 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 and mitophagy. Yeah, very I'm very cool. interested we'll talk in, your, more. <laughs> in your stuff. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's give it up once again for Dr. Devin Inez.